All right, let's try this again. It has been a night for me. All right, let's talk about the pace of evolution and what that means for um, biodiversity and the fitness of, of, of different species within an environment and how that environment resistance changes based on uh, the evolution and the factors that go into evolution. Okay, so that's, that's really, really important that we kind of kind of talk about that, okay? So the pace of evolution, um, that is going to... The pace of evolution is going to affect the biodiversity. It's going to affect the biodiversity. That's really nasty looking, <laughs> so don't worry about that. Let's just get rid of that. You just remember that in your mind. You need to make sure you know that. Okay. Um, these are things that are going to affect the overall success of adaptation. Right? So the rate of environmental change, obviously the faster or slower it goes, um, the more time you're going to have to adapt if it's slower. Right? So slow change is a good thing in terms of um, being able to allow things to adapt. Right? So that's why we read that, watched that video today about why humans haven't been able to adapt to their environment. This is changing so much, right? It's really hard. And, and evolution and, and adaptation take a really long time. Remember that natural selection is what gets adaptation. So if we're waiting for adaptations to occur, it comes from successful reproduction of, of, of good mutations, right? And that, that can only happen um, in the time it takes to get to maturity to reproduce, right? Uh, genetic variation, obviously, the more genetic variation we have, the better... Um, the better our species as a whole will be to adapt to, to things that, that come up. Population size is just about increasing the numbers game, right? So the more um, opportunities you have for the genes to be passed on, the better, right? In generational time, we just talked about this, the shorter generational times, shorter generational times are going to increase um, the rate of mutations being spread, right? All right, let's X this bad boy out. This guy over here. Oh, yeah. Your toast. All right. Okay, so a range of tolerance. We looked at that earlier. That was this, this little chart, right? So this, like, right here, right? So you might have um, these edges here where you can survive, perhaps. So in these two areas, you might be able to, might be able to survive, right? But you're not going to be able to do all the other life functions and roles that you can. Your fitness and your survival of the fittest is going to be here in this optimal range, right? This is, remember, important, important, important that this zone right here, um, when we're talking about fitness, remember the giraffe with a little smirk on his face? Um, this fitness is going to be reproduction, right? So reprodu reproduction, it's nasty. All right, sorry about that reproduce. So your fitness is how you reproduce, right? Um, so we all have like a range that we can perform well in. The limit, and this is all abiotic conditions, the abiotic conditions you can tolerate. So this is your, this is your climate, right? Climate, climate, climate. Sorry, that's gross. It's your climate precipitation. This is your biomes, right? So that's why um, studying biomes is important so we kind of know what's going on. This guy. Get rid of this guy. All right. So this brings us to niches. Uh, fundamental niche is based on your abiotic factors that we talked about in that range of tolerances, and it's the ideal conditions of the species. But your realized niche is so if you remember that little chart we had, right? So this might be your fundamental niche, but perhaps you have other species like yourself that compete with you in, in these regions, right? And they compete with you for resources. So now you only have this other small area to kind of do your thing, right? All right. Uh, so that's the realized niche is when you include abiotic and the biotic, the competitors and predators, right? Okay, and of course you have generalists and specialists, species that only live in specific habitats. They're more likely to go extinct. So think of things that, for generalists here, once you think of animals that live in the trash, right? <laughs> or things that can subsist off of uh, a wider range of things. They have wider roles, right? They can do all these, these crazy, crazy things. They can live in habitats. Think of animals that live pretty much anywhere um, and can eat pretty much anything. And those are going to be your generalists, right? All right. Bye, you're gone. Okay, the five global mass extinctions. Your textbook wants you to know that there are five um, that are, have happened and there are 
in this chart here. But we're in the middle of the sixth one. Okay, so that's that's what you need to know about that. And why are we in the middle of the sixth one? Okay, now, scientists feel that we have something to do with it, right? We have something to do with this one. Okay, and that's the special. That's what's so special about this mass extinction is that it's caused by us, and it's not like it's a mystery. There are human activities that lead to um, that lead to a decrease in biodiversity. When you decrease biodiversity, you are going to increase the chances of things going extinct, right? Because if things pop up. They can't adapt anymore. There, are, there aren't a lot of members on that team that know what to do, if you know what I'm saying. Okay, so let's see here. Bam. What happened? Where are we at? Undo that. All right. Get this out the way. There we go. Still learning this thing. Okay. Human impacts on biodiversity. So it's really cool that we're in a sixth extinction, right? And this is how you can remember how cool it is. Because it is hip, right? We got habitat destruction, invasive species, pollution, and population growth. And we're going to talk about what each one of those does to the environment, okay? How that affects biodiversity. Okay, so first off, habitat destruction. So when we mess with uh, trees, we remove trees, we remove the trees. Um, we mess with the dams and everything, loss of grasslands and um, marshes, uh, all these all these nice coastal lands and everything, it ends up messing with, look at this here, you're not going to have very good gene flow, right, if, if all this stuff is a break, or you have ecotones all over the place now, right, it's going to mess with things. Where's this guy? Okay, so here are some ways that we can restore habitats and kind of um, try to get biodi biodiversity back. You got restoration, trying to return things as similar as possible. Rehabilitation, return degraded ecosystem back to being functional. Replacement is when, well, that's not going to, we can't have a desert here anymore. There's rain, so we have to try to put another ecosystem to hopefully bring some biodiversity back, right? Maybe we can shift around those populations. And then creating artificial ecosystems, such as artificial wetlands for flood reduction and sewage treatment. Remember, this is our, this is recharge, right? Recharge right here, a recharge zone. This is a service that the wetlands give us, right? Very important. Shoot, bring that back. All right, cool. Invasive species. So let's see, when we introduce invasive species, um, they are alien species, exotic species. They often do not have predators. Here is an, a great example of that. So we got these toads here, these African cane toads, I believe they are. Um, they pretty much eat up everything, ruin things for everyone. Not very fun. And then this guy right here, this dastardly, dastardly fish here, um, is the lionfish. You can get them at pet stores. But they pretty much eat up everything. And these like nice venomous barbs here um, do not make it very fun to eat. They actually let you pretty much go and shoot these things out of the water in, in like Florida. Um, no, but they let you fish without a limit. They even have like these fun competitions. And I know it's like, oh, no, save the fish, save the fish. Well, like, these guys are killing everything. They're even worse than we could. They're choking. They're just eating everything. And here you got an invasive vine that obviously doesn't have enough primary consumers to eat them. It's a, basically a, a veritable buffet here, and they won't eat it, right? It took over this entire house. I thought this was a Frodo Baggins house, right? This is, I thought this was a hobbit home. Frodo Baggins was here, right? right no, it's not Frodo Baggins. This is just a... Like the, the trees from the Wizard of Oz throwing apples at us, right? So you have to be careful when it gets introduced because they will overcompete with other animals and they will make that nice fundamental niche turn into un fundamental knot, right? So all this is gone now because this fr friggin' tree just ate up everything, right? It's gone. So now look at the realized niche, it's just this little area right here, right? Good job, good job, tree. It's all your fault. It's all your fault. You're killing the environment. Awesome. Pollution. This should go without saying. Oil spills and organic fertilizers. All right, this is from our, our cleaners, right? Our detergents, things like that. Um, heavy metals, pesticides, all those things. You have to be very careful with them. Pesticides are going to kill off um, things that are not the target species, right? So we have to be very careful that we target the correct things that we're trying to get rid of, that we're identifying as pests, right? So if we kill the non-target species, um, we end up end up messing up the entire trophic trophic pyramid, right? All right. 
human growth population. So we know that we're way over the population that can be sustained by this planet. Right? We're taking, you know, we're end up taking a lot more resources than the Earth can replenish. All right, climate change is easy uh, to forget because we live in hot, hot Texas. That um, you know, the, the global climate ch climate change is, is is true, right? Uh, temperature change is an average, right? You know, we're looking at averages here, so it looks like it's really not that big of a deal. But you know, a ten degree Celsius change um, when you average it out could mean that parts of the planet are getting you know twenty somewhere and like point one somewhere else, right? And you average that out. You know, you know, that ends up that ends up being a considerable, considerably smaller number, but there's some parts of the world that are much hotter and heating up faster than others. And I'll show you a really amazing video of just gigantic sections of Arctic shelf like just falling into the ocean. It's incredible. It's hard to imagine, and it just looks like there's like a cup of ice just shaking around, right? But when they zoom out and they kind of um, superimpose transparencies of, of cities and, and skyscrapers over these ice blocks, you know, it's, it's incredible and, um, and kind of scary a little bit, right? And obviously this polar bear doesn't look like he's having a very good time at all, right? It doesn't look like he's having a very good time. Um, he is not really able to adapt um, to the ice falling out from under his feet, right? That's crazy. You know, I would have a hard time too. Stay strong, polar bear. All right, over-harvesting. Um, I want you to kind of read this. Uh, there's an article at the back of the chapter. I think a 5B packet tells you to read it and kind of make some discussions about why um, bottom feeder oysters and mollusks and things like that, why they are so sensitive to um, human interaction, climate change, things of that sort. Um, it's kind of, it's very jarring, like um, what type of service that organisms in the ocean have, especially like oysters. Um, oysters as a... Oysters, they are they, they filter things out, right? And that's very, very important. Filtering oysters, right? Filter oysters. I want you to kind of remember that as a service, right? That um, that the uh, wildlife and the water plays for us, right? So think about that. All right, this is pretty sad. Because you know, we're not even really using this for anything that's, that's anything other than aesthetic, right? And, and we really get no living utility out of it. It's just, it's just, I guess, people think it's cool to have these things, right? Or maybe they eat the monkey brains, right? I've seen, seen Indiana Jones, right? I don't know. If you have to, you have to. But um, you know, nobody, I don't think, you can't really make a case for why you need this stuff, right? Or, or why this is appealing. Or, you know, you know look what you're doing here. Like, these are animals that were serving a purpose to this ecosystem and you know to use them for this purpose is not only you know, I really really don't have any words for that all right reasons to protect biodiversity this is your bio hotspot right this is your um, your hotspot card that you're working on um, so think about your think about your project that you had and kind of kind of relate what you were learning about the services um, food right this is really easy right? this is low-hanging fruit right here um, no pun intended on that. But the services provided by your ecosystem are going to be food, right? Like the, the, air, the people that live around there, they subsist off of it. Um, medicine, like more than two-thirds of our, a lot of our medicines come from like rain for, tropical rainforests and forests in general. Lumber, we build things with it. Uh, protect, production of CO2 as a waste product. Pollination of our crops. Don't forget that all the trees and plant life, they are a very important CO2 sink. They're part of the nutrient cycle, right? So think about your biomes and, and, and the percentage of precipitation that leads to um, gigantic, basically CO2 pillars, right? Those gigantic trees. Hey, genetic reserves, right? We're talking about the biodiversity. Just in case something bad happens, you know, we have like a pool of survivors to pull from that might be able to adapt to it. All right, cool. Okay, so I'm just going to leave this here for a second. You can, like, look at this. But this is what I was trying to say earlier, right? About, look at that, two-thirds. Look at some of these plants here. Pretty cool, right? Look at the Pacific U. 
Box globe. Did you tell it's failure of heart? Going on for malaria treatment. This is one of the first prophylaxis they use for uh, some of those mosquito-borne illnesses or malaria. Rosie, Rosie Periwinkle. Wonderful. You could lose all this, right? So that's why we got to maintain biodiversity in these hot spots, right? So the importance of genetic diversity. So if something happens, something bad happens, they're more successful to an environmental change. It will allow for some of the population to survive. In small populations, you got inbreeders, right? It's not good. Their offspring are going to have harmful mutations. Remember, a lot of the times the mutations, the leftover... We said leftover crap um, usually gets to tag along because remember the lowest common denominator for fitness? Remember this? We're talking about fitness. We are talking about reproducing, reproducing, right? So as long as you have a high ability to reproduce, you can keep a lot of the bad uh, or just inconsequential mutations that don't matter, right? But if you have inbreeding, you are increasing the numbers of Fatal mutations. That's not good. All right, let's get rid of this. All right, endangered species. So you need to know the difference between endangered and threatened. Soon become extinct. And still in the natural range for threatened, but it can become endangered in the near future. Okay, just make sure you know that. And these are some examples of it. Grizzly bear. Remember, big the Yellowstone National Park is one of the few places where the grizzly bear still lives. Kirkland's warbler, golden cactus, Florida manatee, and the African elephant. Right. Okay, these are. This is an important page right here. So make sure you know this. Okay, so this increases the likelihood of extinction, right? So low reproductive rate. So remember, if you're not reproducing, you are not increasing your numbers. And your biodiversity is not going to increase. So if you have specialized feeding patterns, you are picky. Right, that means if your food source is gone, guess what happens to you? Gone. Okay. Specialized nesting or breeding habits. Remember, so this is really, really, really bad if you have habitat destruction, right? So if you have some sort of habitat destruction. Sorry about that. Destruction. So if you have habitat destruction, what is going to happen to your ability to pass on genes? Right? If you can't make nests because all the, the trees and stuff you use to build, build your nests in are gone, guess what? You're going to lose your ability to reproduce. If you feed at high trophic levels, that means you're one of those high-level high, high level predators or something. If you start losing um, your habitat, guess what's going to go? All the primary consumers. If the primary consumers are gone. Your stuff's going to be gone too. If you're found only in one region, if something bad happens to that region, um, you're done. Fixed migratory patterns. So if you always go the same route every year, every year, every year. So if this is your path, you like to go through, you know, you like to always travel through this, along the stream right here, right? And then all of a sudden somebody comes in and goes, Aah! and they break this part. Uh, and now your path now has no water and you're going to die. It's awesome. Yeah. Uh, if you prey on livestock, so if you bug humans, basically, uh, they're going to kill you. We know this. Ask any, you know, cockroach or mosquito, right? right. Here's this little guy. Okay. So in situ conservation means leaving the animal where it lives and protecting it. So elephants, we just kind of put things in place like anti-poaching laws. And uh, we try to enforce it. So we enforce laws. This is a, a countermeasure to the loss of uh, habitat and also... Um, maintaining biodiversity, right? So they're going to ask you, like, what are ways, what are services that are being threatened and what are ways that we can counter counteract that, right? And usually it's enforce laws or create laws or bans, right, on certain things. This is cool, like in Hawaii, um, you're not allowed to even pet the turtles, right? You can't touch them. So these are just kind of ideas of laws. We're leaving the animals there, but enforcing laws that kind of um, increase those animals' numbers, So ex situ is when you actually take them out in is inside the habitat. Ex situ is exfiltrate, you know, export them, right? So egg pulling is one of them. Captive breeding is another. 
And I really have always felt a little uncomfortable around zoos just because I'm like, oh, you know, let the animals be where they be, right? But sometimes there's such a endangered species that if you take them out and you give human beings a little bit of entertainment, I know it's kind of kind of weird, but if you give humans a little bit of entertainment by getting to look at them, they grow an appreciation for that. So that um, recreational utility you're getting out of it is a service, right? But it's also leading perhaps to increasing the numbers of those animals in the wild, right? especially if they reintroduce them, right? So that's important. It's something, you know, it's an argument to be made, right? You know, whether you feel comfortable with that or not, it's up to you, but uh, it definitely is an argument with some evidence to kind of back it up. Um, let's see, what did I do there? That's too much. That's too much. All right, there we go. So we can do laws like cities, right? And there are a red list of animals and endangered species that won't allow you to trade them, right? It won't allow you to trade them or trade people who have traded them, right? All right, so the Cities Act. All right, so what's that mean? The Cities Act. And it restricts the actions, it restricts actions that uh, would endanger species and their habitats, forbids the trade of these species, authorize governments to purchase land. This is important. And actually a lot of them, um, in the times where government can't do it, um, private organizations will, will purchase leases to government land, and they will basically just um, say, okay, well, I have the hunting and fishing rights to this area, and I'm going to say no hunting and fishing for a long time, as long as I have this land. So they can kind of uh, regrow the, the population of animals and hopefully increase biodiversity. And but that's kind of, you know, we, we come to a head right here um, when you slow development or the economy. And remember that conservation nowadays, especially within the context of our textbook and the class, is looking for a trifecta between nature or the environment. So we want nature. Nature is important, of course. You want the people, right, PPL, to benefit from nature, but you also want the economy to benefit too. So if you can get all three of these to kind of work together, it's, um, it's the trifecta. It's a good thing, right? All right, let's get rid of this. Okay. The Lacey Act. It's a U.S. law that prohibits the trade in wildlife, fish, and plants that have been illegally harvested and sold. Helps to control invasive species as well, right? So if you're not allowed to bring in this, this um, you know, invasive toad or something that's going to mess everything up, um, these laws can help, help maintain biodiversity of a, of a, of a biome. All right. So do you understand now how um, our climates are affected by human interaction and why we, with our own human interaction, need to be conscientious about what it is we're changing in these environments. What are the services we get from them? And is it possible to just fix things by moving them to other locations? So think about how those um, biomes came about and how they developed. They're not just random, but they're, they're based on the abiotic conditions in that area, right? So I want you to think about fitness of organisms, um, what it takes for an organism to adapt. And think about what we can do to maintain biodiversity. Okay, so these are all things in the FRQ that you probably want to think about and make connections of.